for daughter. Princess Jungkook, uh, she is the first daughter of His Highness Prince Devavong, Devavong uh, Varopagan, and Lady Prince Devavong uh, Nantia was born from Lachawong Panti Devavong in 1909. Most of her adolescent years were spent most of her adolescent years were spent abroad. Princess Jungkook returned to Thailand at the age of 14, when she pursued her education at Rajini School and Assumption Convent School. Subsequently, she entered the royal court as a lady in waiting for Queen Lampai Pani, the Queen Consort of King Prachatipo of Siam. Later, on a scholarship, she studied the French language in Switzerland for a year before returning to Thailand. She was the grand royal wedding with Prince Jumpot Pong Bari. In the middle, a photo. Princess Jumpot gave birth uh, to her only daughter, Princess Marathi Sukumpan Bari in 1931. Princess Marathi Bari would go on to specialize in arts and art history, creating numerous contemporary paintings. Life at the left. After the death of Prince Jumpot in 1959, Princess Jumpot established the Jumpot Panti Foundation. In his commemoration, she dedicated herself to public charity in accordance with his intention, supporting various causes such as the Royal Cross Society, Agricultural Development, and the Arts and Culture. Princess Jumpot passed away at the age of uh, 78 on May uh, 29, 1987. And the anniversary of her birth is celebrated as the Jumpot Pantit Day by the Jumpot Pantit Foundation. In 1950, the National Art Exhibition organized by the Department of Fine Arts and Silapakon University serve as the primary platform for Thai artists. The annual exhibition aimed as a means of searching and commenting the progress and movement of artists, and also as a means of provoking Thai people to pay interest in modern art as well. Professors in PRC also hope it would provide artists with additional income to support their livelihoods and families. That's why effort to garner support from government, units, and private sector uh, for the benefit of artists. The requests were not entirely successful. Apart from the lack of government support and patronage from public sector for the purchase of artworks, Simpiracy highlight uh, in his article in comment on the 12th National Art Exhibition in the catalog in 1961. Simple said, when asked about a modern art institute in Thailand to foreign them, he expressed regret, stating, sorry, sorry, very sorry, we have, but we have no gallery of modern art. Undoubtedly, the absence of support from government, unit, and public sector comply with the lack of uh, and an uh, actual modern art institute posed a significant challenge for the artistic community in Thailand during that era. The Makassan Group emerged in response to this need, named after its location at Makassan Circle in Bangkok. This artist group organized an art gallery in the building they established. Members including Damropo Ubra, Anampani Pichai Niran, Tawi Rashani Gon, Priyang Priyang Sai Si, Nobrak Li Isi, In Son Bong Sam, Song Yot Song Lai, Prapan Si Suta, and American woman artist Sinada Johnson. Were progressive thinker most from Sinapakon University, they can be considered pioneers of Agongkan artist group endeavoring 
to provide a space for art that wasn't affiliated <coughs> in government entitlement. That aim was to offer opportunity, opportunity for creative works rejected from the national art exhibition. Present diverse forms of art and focus on allowing artistic expression without being bound by the decision and guideline of competition committees. Furthermore, they sought to create a space for artists to present their creative works in their own ways. A collaborating approach not seen in previous era, like the abstract art. In 1961, in 1961, the Makassan Group collaborated to establish the Bangkok Art Center around Makassan, around Makassan Circle. Professors in PRC was invited to serve as an advisor of the center. The gallery not only showcased the work of the Makassan Group, but also those rejected from the National Art Exhibition too. According to Professor Abhinan Bosoyano in his study, uh, Modern Art in Thailand, 19th and 20th century, he, he's known uh, Bangkok Art Center became a new alternative place for artists and art lovers who would like to support the new artists. The art lover and the supporter is like Thai and foreign journalists, including Vilad Maniwat, he is a writer, and Darrell Barikan, editor of Bangkok World Newspaper, and Michael Smithy, art columnist of the Bangkok World Newspaper, and prominent figures in the art community such as Kun Misiyam Yip In Soi. She is the business person, artist, and art collector. Chuladun in the in the right. He, he is an art collector and writer. And Princess Tupon actively support the Makassan Group and the Bangkok Art Center. However, the primary source of income for the art gallery came from selling artworks. And art patron were limited to specific businessmen, high society, individual in Thailand with a passion for the art and foreigner. Meanwhile, the landlord of the center chief forgot toward commercial business. A concept that clashed with the idea of the young artist. Eventually, the Makassan group was compelled to work here the Bangkok Art Center, leading to the rapid closure of the world. The Bangkok Art Center served as meeting point for the group where they had the privilege of meeting Princess Jumpot during one of their exhibitions. After her visit to Makassan Group exhibition, Princess Jumpot extended an invitation to the Rongbong Bukhara and several artists from the group to Suipaka Palace. Subsequently, discussion ensued leading to the decision to transform part of the palace into the art gallery. Okay, this is a picture of a Soipaka uh, uh, Palace actually in the opening. On January 1962, Soipaka Palace Art Gallery opened in Dong with in, in, in inaugural art exhibition accompanied by the recognition of outstanding achievement in art through a war. Prominent social status drew significant attention to the art exhibition at Sonpaka and Gallery, generating interest from mass media and a broad audience, allowing artists to successfully sell their creation. Their, their creation. The high society figure and foreign guests, especially invited by Princess Tupot, for art exhibition opening emerged as the primary buyer of this private art gallery. This is an exhibition in um, Sonpaka uh, Palace Art Gallery. However, the passing of professors in PRC on 14 May 1962 triggered changing in the artistic circle. The Makassan group predominantly comprised of PRC disciples. 
This band add, add, adds artists' thought to broaden their knowledge. An artistic experience. Some pursue education on abroad, such as the Rombo Opera, who received British Council scholarship for further study in London, England. Rapunzel Sutana obtained a scholarship for studying in Berlin, Germany, while in Sonbongsa in the Rhine, embarked on a world journey by scooter. Concurrently, some artists pursue career as art teacher, while others choose to part independent artists. Remarkable, Sonaga Palace Art Gallery has endured through the years, uh, evolved into a museum that has a collection of valuable objects, including Princess Junpot Art Collection, accessible for public appreciation. The foraging of the Bangkok Art Center and Sunpaka Palace Art Gallery marked a significant period, leading to the emergence of several public art galleries in subsequent decades. This gallery organized by businessmen and art lovers, such as Bangkapi Gallery at Aso, uh, Soy Aso, Sukhumit Road, by the owner, police, uh, Major Sukhumit to the Younger. This is a picture uh, from the opening of Kutuwan, Dachani, and Bakapi Gallery. Many young artists found themselves susceptible to exploitation by art dealers and entrepreneurs who undersold their work. The focus on sales and, adhering, and adherence to specific art trends led to the issue of exclusivity hindering artists from introducing diverse style to the market and impending the overall development of the art scene. The problem prompted the Makassan Group, founder of the Bangkok Art Center, to consider uh, re-establish another private art gallery. This decision followed the return of some group members who had pursued study abroad. In 1966, by he is an architecture student at Sulapakon University and owner of the building in the Batum Wan area. The group successfully founded Batum Wan Gallery. Notably, they invite Princess Jumpot to serve as the gallery special advisor. This group, which had differences with differences with traditional artists voice objection to the judging result of the national art exhibition. Following this agreement, several artists refrain from submitting their creation to subsequent national art exhibition. The majority of exhibit pieces at the Tung Wan Gallery, either abstract art or semi-abstract art. During the mid 1960s decade, abstract art popularity among the younger generation of artists, not only within private art gallery, found by artists, but also in prestigious when you like the National Art Exhibition too. The shift was influenced by the exposure of students and emerging artists to the global fine arts movement too to take books and interaction with the Bakon University lecturer, who were seasoned artists with international study experience. In the later part of 1960 decade, our students had the opportunity to pursue further study in America and Europe, following the footsteps of their mentor and senior student. For instance, Dambrombo Opera, received a scholarship from the Business Council and when he returned to Thailand in 1963, upon his return, the wrong artistic style evolved from depicting Thai ways life to embracing abstract painting. And the right is the Pira Atana Pirade painting abstract. The second art exhibition in the December 1966 and the third in May 1967 
at Batum Wine Gallery. Continue the trend of showcasing predominantly abstract art that was popular among artists in the late 1960 decade to 1970 decade, including Namrong Wong Upara, Prabhan Sinsuta, Pira Patina Pirade, Protean Angela, and Tang Chan, self taught artists. But here, a full time artist since the early 1960s, and Tang Chan, an artist since the early 1950s, decade, was well known among the university intellectual and embraced social concept. His pioneering work in concrete poetry and action painting influenced by Eastern philosophy later than Western abstract expressionist was showcased at Batum Wan Gallery. Uh, the right photo is a Pira Patana Piride, and Tang Chan, Tang Long, and Patriot. And this group at the Batum Wan Gallery. And this picture came to the cover of the uh, catalog. Marking a significant movement in other circle, this exhibition at the Batum Wan Gallery were aligned with prison, prison, Princess Chumpot commitment to supporting the art community. This is the opening of Batum Wan Gallery picture. In 1970, Prabhupada Sita returned to Thailand from Germany, Dambrong Mokubara from the USA, and Pira Patnak Piradev returned from Museum Management Study on USA, in USA. Meanwhile, artists and manager gathered at Patumwan Gallery. These three artists had received consistent support from Princess Jumpot since the time of the Bangkok Art Center, Sunpakar Palace, Art Gallery, and Batum Wan Gallery. During that period, Thawan Dachani also returned from studying abroad. These artists shared the common goal of finding a venue to exhibit their creative works and organize art activity. Princess Jumpot as always, supported them by providing personal land for artists, for artists resident and, and studio in the area of Ban Men Priyap, located at Soi Atakan Prasit, Sathon Dai Road, Bangkok. Ban Men Priyap became a meeting place of many artists during was the residence and art studio of the new generation of artists. Princess Jumpot conceived the idea of establishing an official art workshop, specifically for printmaking art studio. This idea materialized in the construction of the main Prayag Art Center in 1972 and officially opening in 1973 by Pira Patana Piride, assuming the role of director. The art center expenses were under the patronage of Jumpot Pati Foundation, providing a studio and material for artists to create their work, including an expensive printmaking equipment. Princess Jumpot expressed her intention in the art catalog introducing the main Payak Art Center, emphasizing her desire for it uh, to be a growing seed for the future and a shelter to the contemporary art of time. This is one main Payak Art Center. And the one that should be at uh, main Payak Art Center. After Professor Simpiracy demise in 1962, his disciple took up the mantle establishing the BSC Institute of Modern Art Foundation. Princess Jumpot 
assume the role of chairman with Dr. Poi Ung Pangkorn, the director of Budget Guru, as deputy chairman. Their primary responsibility was to raise funds for the institute construction, organizing activity to support the cause. The foundation identified the Sanam Siapa area owned by the Crown Property Bureau and soon to be ranked by the Tourism Organization of Thailand as an ideal location. However, challenges arose when uh, July 1969. The Crown Property Bureau informed the foundation that the land could not be used for the art gallery. As the Office of National Security had requested to rent the entire piece of land for military purpose. Despite the setback, construction continued ultimately, concluding with the unwavering support of Princess Jumpot and Dr. Boy in Pangkorn. The collaboration between Dr. Boy, Ung Pangkorn, and Princess Jumpot gained momentum when Dr. Boy visited the main Payap Art Center, where artists including Damrong Mongubara and Hira Patanak Pirade were creating groundbreaking works. Recognizing the potential, it was agreed that the same area of the main Payap Art Center would be used for construction of BRC Institute of Modern Art. With the support of Princess Jumpot, who provide the land for construction and financial support. From fundraising activities, the BRC Institute of Modern Art, designed by Mom Luong, was successfully completed. The left picture, uh, Princess Jumpot and Dr. Poon, when she, uh, they came to uh, Mek Priyap Art Center and the right, Mong Luong Tri Tosun Tevakun present the plan, uh, architecture plan to Princess Jumpot for construction the BRC Institute of Modern Art. Officially, uh, BRC Institute of Modern Art officially opened on May 14, 1974, marking the 12th anniversary of BRC passing. Queen Lampai Pani, the Queen Consort of King Pachatipo, presided over the opening ceremony. The establishment of the PRC Institute of Modern Art reflected with Princess Jumpot sincere commitment and, determine, and determination to support the modern art scene in Thailand. It served as a platform for artistic creativity, a learning center, and a space for the development of aesthetic experience for the public. Emphasizing diversity, the Institute welcomed all fields of arts, including music, cinema, performing art, visual art, and literature. In 1976, Mr. Chan Bichai from Tatawati, a significant artistic figure, was appointed as the director of the PRC Institute of Modern Art receiving substantial support and opportunity from Princess Jumpot. Throughout the 1970 decade to 1980 decade, the BRC Art Institute organized versatile exhibition serving as a meeting place for the exchange of ideas and perspectives among Thai and foreign individuals in the art circle including young generation art students passionate about art and culture. The administrative committee of the PRC Art Institute continued to co-organize special activity 
known as waiting summary. Uh, the first time of experimental program. Waiting summary, first time of experimental program. This serves as a venue for exhibiting various arts such as performing art, installation art, happening art, experimental music, video art, poetry reading. At the picture, Kun Basel Chan Dam. He is a writer and poetry. Uh, he uh, action poetry at Wei Samai activity. This is a uh, exhibition uh, of Kun Wasan City K. Uh, exhibition title Sickness Edge at Korean uh, Institute. And this is a several uh, opening art exhibition at Virus Modern Art uh, Institute of Modern Art. This reflects the artist's interest in conveying decorative work of experimental art. Introducing something new and astonishing to Thai society in the transition period of the Thai art scene evolving from modern art thinking and expression into the contemporary. The BRC Institute of Modern Art stands as a supportive space for creative movement. It allocates space for artists to perform or organize activities presenting ideas that evolve with the changing context of social, political, economic, and cultural landscape. Unfortunately, after Princess Dupont passed away and had, and had a budget problem, the BRC Institute of Modern Art had to close down. Some of the things that I have present is happened. I think it's a part. Uh, it's a part of the role of Princess Pantip Boripak Jumpon. Uh, thank you very much. Historical, historiography and with art. His current book project, 
considers how art histories have been reimagined within artistic practice across the region during the 12th, 20th, and 21st centuries. He is the co founding co editor of South East of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art in Asia. So, please, Assistant Professor Roger Nesan. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Um, it's a real honour and pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank the organisers for putting together this event. Um, when Nina Tanabis first spoke to me about this symposium, um, I agreed right away since it's such an important and indeed understudied topic. And it was only after agreeing that I began to realise that I don't really know if I'm sure what private patronage might mean in this context. Um, I began to realise that many of the kinds of patronage that might seem to have been private are also in some ways corporate or national or otherwise institutional. Um, the line between the private and the public seems often to be blurry. I also began to realise that many kinds of support for art and artists might be too small, say, small scale and scattered to really count as patronage, and yet might together have a cumulative effect that makes it worthy of study in the same way that patronage is. So in other words, it seems that the line between the individual, one-off support and patronage might also be indistinct. So today's paper is an attempt to try and stay with my troubling uncertainty about what an earth private patronage might mean here, to sit with, if you like, my queer confusion, and to begin to examine what I see as the instability of this concept of private patronage in this region. I think this instability of the concept may be productive, but I'll offer no definite conclusions here. I'm not trying to confidently prove that the concepts of the private and your patronage are objectively unstable, but rather to tentatively um, prospect the possibility that these terms and the ideas that they point to may sometimes dissolve under scrutiny. Um, and may refer to practices that are not securely cited in a single person or place, but rather dispersed across an indistinct terrain. Um, the examples that I'll discuss are not so much representative case studies, but rather theoretical objects or forms of critical activity to test and tease out ideas. Um, and they range across different times and places, uh, the modern and the contemporary. So in other words, these are notes towards a view that's comparative both geographically and historically. Um, this is not, I should apologise in advance, a comprehensive presentation of research, or an invitation or perhaps provocation for further thinking as we embark on this research. So in what follows, I'm going to try and think through three key terms, private, patronage and foreign. In all three of these concepts, I'll be paying particular attention to the porosity or interplay between the individual and the collective or institutional. So some questions that I want to ask are, when is a person a private patron and when are they acting on behalf of an institution or state body? When is a patron perceived or understood as being an individual and when as part of a larger organisation? Where is the line between a one-off purchase of an artwork, for example, and a sustained practice of patronage? And might it be productive to study one-off purchases that are scattered across the globe as if they cumulatively play the same role in our historical terms that patronage usually does? And I don't pretend to offer any answers to these questions, um, rather to see this symposium as the starting point for more research. So the first question that I'd like to ask first troubling or queer instability that I'd suggest we try and stay with is why does the issue of private patronage even matter? And to think about this question, I want to turn uh, to a contemporary artist who is doing art historical work, which is a mode of practice that I call artistic art histories. What you see here are stills from a film made by the artist Triwana Spong, whose family is Balinese, but who was raised in New Zealand and now lives and works in London. This is the first artwork that Spong has ever made which directly addresses her Balinese heritage. This is after about two decades of practice. Um, it's a 32 minute video filmed entirely in her family home in Sanur on Bali's east coast. And the film centers on this painting, which was painted by her grandfather, um, 
the artist Agustin Malo Rundu, who died in 1993. Spong does various kinds of art historical research um, on this painting, including interviewing her father, Agustin Rundu's son. Among other art historical topics, the two do discuss the matter of patronage. Do you know why your dad hates animals a lot? Spong asks her father. I don't know, he answers. Maybe in order? He liked animals. He liked dogs, her father continues. In this excerpt from their dialogue, despite its brevity, some deceptively complex ideas about patronage are conveyed. The first is an unembarrassed acknowledgement that patronage can indeed play a role in shaping artistic production. Spong's father readily admits that Gusti Rundu may well have painted animals a lot simply because his customers requested it. Maybe in order, he says. But second is an accompanying insistence that the preferences of clients or patrons are always to be considered in tandem with the artist's own desires. Gusti Rundu also liked animals, he liked dogs, we're told. Indeed, not only in the painting scene in Shubana Spong's video, but in many other well-documented works by Gusti Rundu, such as these, we can certainly observe that animals were a favourite subject matter of the painters. This helps to distinguish Gusti Rundu's work from that of other Balinese artists, including others from the school of Sandor. To my knowledge, before Spong's artistic art history, no other art historian has asked why this may have been the case, and what may have inspired or motivated Gusti Rundu to de repeatedly depict animals in his paintings. With just this very brief exchange, Spong's video serves to remind us that patronage may have played a role. And the sequence also reminds us that if, if this was the case, in the view of Spong's father and informant, it does not necessarily diminish Gusti Rundu's artistic achievement. We may recall that Spong's video is titled The Painter Taylor. Later in the work, Spong's father tells us that Gusti Rundu worked both with art and with sewing. He was a painter before, and then turned into a tailor, and then back again to painting, he says. Again, the brevity and simplicity of the words belies their ability to convey, convey the complex nuances of what we might today call a hyphenated or intersectional artistic practice. He goes on to explain what motivated this repeated switching backwards and forwards between painting and tailoring. He was, maybe when the painting was down, meaning when there weren't many customers it seems, he jumped to working as a tailor, then when the orders came, then he painted again. Again, a straightforward and unembarrassed acknowledgement that patronage played a role in shaping or secret his practice, that he painted only when there were people wanting to buy his work. But again, there's no sense that this diminishes his significance as an artist. On the contrary, Spong's father goes on to suggest that he's rather proud of his father's ability to have adapted and jumped backwards and forwards between painting and tailoring. After the Japanese came out, meaning after the end of the World War II occupation, and the economy was getting better, he painted again so he could keep the family. The key here is that Gusti Rundu worked both, both as an artist and in other trades so that he could keep and support his family, and his family is clearly very grateful for this service. Patronage matters in this view not only or perhaps even primarily for art historical reasons but also for lived material familial reasons. He was not a talented artist, the narrator goes on. He followed a crowd. Someone ordered this, and he knows how to make it. These words coming from an art historian would surely sound judgmental and pejorative, but when Spong's father says this, he sounds grateful, not negative. He sees Gusti Wunder's ability to adapt to the tastes of his customers or collectors, or perhaps patrons, as being a sign of his skill in being able to succeed as an artist. It's very hard, the narrator says, with palpable admiration and respect. But he did it all the same, so he can keep the family. That is, so he can take care of his wife and children and other relatives in their large and lush estate in Sanor, which is where Spong has shot this film. We may notice that in these various exchanges, it's never exactly clear whose orders Gusti Rundu was catering to. Orders from whom? 
were these people one-off customers, or were they patrons, perhaps collectors with a sustained and ongoing practice of supporting the artist? And if they were patrons, was this private patronage? Or was it corporate patronage, perhaps from a hotel or some other industry in Bali? Or was it state patronage, perhaps from a museum or another institution? We don't know. We're never told. And it seems to me that one reason for this, or why we're never told if this was private patronage that sustained Gusti Bundu, is that it simply didn't matter. For Gusti Bundu's family, including for the contemporary artist who run a spawn, all that matters was that he worked very hard, that he was able to support and to keep his family. Whether he was able to do this because of the support of one-off collectors or ongoing patrons, it's not important from the perspective of the artist's family even when they are the ones doing the art historical research within this artwork. And it's also not important whether he received patron support in the form of private patronage or corporate or state patronage. And so with that in mind, I'd now like to move on to the second troubling instability that I suggest we may need to stay with. So my second question is, how do we separate or distinguish private patronage from institutional patronage? Often, one individual may operate in both capacities, and I think this phenomenon may be particularly prevalent in this region and therefore worth paying attention to. Here are some recent and I think probably very familiar examples of patronage that I think raise this question. Many of us will be well acquainted with the important patronage offered by private museums across the region. One of the earliest, the OHD Museum in Magalang in Indonesia, is named after its founder, the collector Hui Hong Jin, who was established in 1997. A year later, the Sela Sa Scenario Art Space was opened, named after its founder, the Artist Scenario, and more recent museums such as Mokka in Bangkok and Mike Hill in Chiang Mai are not named after their founders, but are nevertheless very widely understood to be largely shaped by the visions and priorities of these private individuals. Although all of these museums employ teams of capable and clever staff, the collections and programming at all of these institutions seems, based on anecdotal impressions of this, to be very closely associated with the ideas and preferences of the museum's founders. So my question is, should these and other private museums across Southeast Asia be considered instances of private patronage or not? More than mere semantics, I think this question really matters for a couple of reasons. First, of course, there are strong signs that private museums and other privately funded art institutions will continue to proliferate across the region and will largely play a growing role in its arts ecologies in years to come. But the second reason is that I think for us to critically study the activities and contributions of such institutions, we may need to decide whether to consider them the work of corporate entities or private individuals, or perhaps both. Research on these kinds of institutions will largely rely uh, not only on publicly available records and information, but also on insider insights, including rumors and gossip. We may need to learn from the example of sociologists and others who have studied gossip and rumors as a form of social control, which can be applied in a critical and pro-social way, and is especially important when other more official forms of regulation or critique are unavailable or impractical. So if we want to study private museums and other privately funded institutions, we may need to listen to gossip and rumors. But first, we'll need to decide the extent to which these institutions are shaped by their founders in order to decide how relevant gossip about these private individuals might be for critical research on these open to the public museums. In many cases, I think the line between the private individual founder of a museum and its patronage as enacted by a wider body of staff, advisors, board members, donors, is a blurry line that may often dissolve. There are, of course, numerous historical precedents for this indistinct delineation between a private collection and an organization or public collection, albeit at very different scales and levels and with very different motivations. President Sukarno, King Bumi Bun, Prince Sihanouk, and the presidential Marcoses, for example, all played singular and defining roles in supporting the arts during the mid to late 20th century, and all of them acted both as individuals and also on behalf of their nations. Collections and institutions which are now considered public 
are at the same time inseparable from the private networks, private preferences, private visions, and private priorities of these individuals. The works collected in Indonesia by Sukarno and his staff were published in 1956 as paintings from the collection of Dr. Sukarno, President of the Republic of Indonesia. This simple phrase is also quite complex, as it both points to and simultaneously collapses the distinction between the man and the nation. The collection, of course, is now overseen by the Gallery Nacional in Jakarta, yet artworks from this group are still referred to as the presidential collection when they are exhibited or published. And so thus, even more than half a century after Sukarno's fall and death, the line between his private and his public role as a patron of the arts remains in distinct precisely because the artworks he collected are retained in a distinct group and available to researchers as such. The blurring between a private and a national collection is even more unclear in the case of Sihanouk in Cambodia, who, like Sakarno in Indonesia, was an avid collector of paintings, as well as a supporter of dance and performing arts, and also like Sakarno, he saw the arts as being closely related to post-colonial nation-building. Whereas Sukarno's collection was published in 1956 at the height of his rule, the extent of Sihanouk's collection has never been shared in a consolidated fashion. Thus, it's never been quite clear which of the artworks he acquired were purchased for himself, which for his private quarters, which for the royal institutions of the palace, and which for the state institutions of the nation. The disruptions caused by the passage of time, and more specifically by the violent upheavals in Cambodia during and after the 1970s, make these murky overlaps even more unclear. For example, this painting by Nyak Dim was originally hung in a private dining room in one of Sihanouk's private royal residences. We see it here in this still from one of the many films made by Sihanouk, including during his time as the head of state during the 1960s. These films were considered both private activities under his own name and also as state projects which were funded and broadcast nationally. The line between the personal and the institutional was unclear with Sihanouk's filmmaking just as with his collection and patronage of art. The whereabouts of this near dim painting are now unknown. Is it still within the palace's collection? Should it be considered private or public property? The answers to these questions are also unknown. I'd now like to shift focus from the question of what is private to the also troubling issue of what constitutes patronage. These matters are related and entangled with each other and also with the idea of the foreign, which I'll turn to later. I want to look at some examples of artworks that were purchased by individuals who were also diplomats or otherwise employed by foreign states. Ordinarily, an individual buying one or two paintings would not really constitute patronage meaning it would not be significant enough to be studied as such. We usually reserve that term to describe a sustained activity of ongoing support for the arts that's large enough to have a substantial impact on an arts ecology and or on art history. But if enough individual foreign diplomats purchase artworks, then together they do have a real and significant impact on arts ecosystems and on art history. So how should we think about these individual purchases made by private individuals? Should they be considered a kind of patronage because of their cumulative effect? This painting, also by Nguyen Dung, for example, was bought by an American soldier who was fighting in Vietnam and took his leave in Phnom Penh. He carried the painting back to the US with him, where it was ultimately inherited by another person who found it in the back of the cupboard of a mobile home that he bought after its original owner had passed away. Thereafter, the painting eventually, eventually made its way to Singapore's national collection, where it remains today the only work by Yip Din. It's an important piece, which as we can see here, was widely reproduced um, at the time of its uh, first exhibition, both in calendars that were distributed nationally throughout Cambodia, as well as in the Free World magazine, um, which was distributed throughout Southeast Asia by the US during these Cold War years. Similarly, these paintings were bought by Australian diplomats who were stationed in Phnom Penh during the 1960s. The work on the right uh, was purchased in a boutique shop, while the work on the left was bought directly from the artist um, by its owner, who also commissioned and to paint portraits of his wife and daughters. Next month, in March 2024, 
form, this painting on the left will shift from private to public hands when its owner donates it to the recently opened Sassoro Museum in Phnom Penh, which is owned and operated by the state-owned National Bank of Cambodia. There, it will be the only painting by Nephew to be placed on permanent public view anywhere in Cambodia. Other works owned by state institutions there are either not on view or else not accessible to the public. So these two paintings today both play a significant role in the public appreciation of Cambodia's modern art history. Both are now or will soon be looked at after thanks to the public patronage of state institutions in Singapore and in Cambodia. Yet both paintings were originally purchased by private individuals as essentially one-off one -off purchases. These were not collectors with sustained uh, and ongoing practices of washing artists. Yet we know that they were far from the only one-off purchases by individuals who worked as foreign soldiers or diplomats in Southeast Asia during the Cold War period. So I'm wondering whether it would be productive to think of these dispersed activities as a kind of private patronage. Nixon is, of course, not the only artist for whom foreign diplomats were an important source of support and whose works were therefore widely dispersed. Stories abound about the role played by the social, social class diplomats in supporting modern and contemporary artists in this region. For example, the art historian Nora Taylor describes artists from South Vietnam clandestinely selling their works to diplomats after 1975. She notes that the actual number of works sold was never recorded since the artists feared reprimands from cultural officials, but that a major exhibition of works by Wish Wan Fai held in Stockholm in 2000 suggests that a very large volume of works that were collected by Swedish diplomats alone um, during this period. Also in Vietnam, the Malaysian diplomat Dato Parameswaran collected hundreds of war drawings and related um, artworks throughout the 1990s, which have recently been shown in a series of exhibitions at the NUS Museum in Singapore. And in yet another example, works by the Filipino painter Fernando Amarasolo are widely reputed to have been especially popular with foreign diplomats, and therefore often turn up auctions in the most unlikely, unlikely places. This work, for example, was recently sold by a small Australian auction house um, and was originally from the collection of a former Australian diplomat who bought it in Manila directly from the artist in 1965. There are, of course, many more examples like this, and I suspect that it might be a valuable exercise to um, perhaps a little more systematically gather some of these together to start to build a picture of the role played by foreign diplomats in supporting artists in this region. Um, even though their artworks have since been quite widely dispersed. Focusing on this issue may give us a new and perhaps somewhat dissolved understanding of the concept of patronage, requiring perhaps new definitions of the term that refunction it from its Western origins. <coughs> With this, I'd now like to turn our attention to the third of the three terms that I'm interested in thinking about today, and this is the foreign. For the last few years, I've been doing research on this artist, Inuya Sinasa, uh, who was active in Indonesia during the 1940s and 1950s. She's important for a few reasons. First, for having produced highly original paintings, some of which, like this example, were based on photographs by her white artist peers at the time, and thus may be considered a kind of artistic art history, like that um, by Shiwana Spong, who I discussed earlier. Inuria is also important for having been one of the earliest Southeast Asian women to professionally exhibit um, as an artist in this period. My research on Inuria builds on the important work of other art historians, including Heidi Arbuckle, who collected oral histories of Inuria's life and work from various people, including from diplomats in Indonesia. Oral histories were important and necessary um, in the work of these art historians because there were no known sources of writing by Inuria. But that's recently changed when I came across a treasure trove in the archives in Leiden. Letters from Emilia to a Dutch professor that had never before been accessed by researchers and that altogether amassed some 60,000 words, which I had translated to English. These letters are the first time that we've had access to Emilia's own voice, and they proved to be very valuable source of information and insight. Throughout these letters, Several times, Emilia refers to foreigners having supported her work. In one memorable passage, she writes that, were she to travel again to Europe, as she had before the war, then, and I quote, I wouldn't have to worry about foreign currency. I have living currency, 
the form of my paintings. The many mentions of foreign supporters throughout Hero's letter, letters came as no surprise to me. When I interviewed a uh, distant relative um, in Georgia character, um, he spoke proudly, but also sadly, about how much of her work had been, had been patronized by foreign diplomats. Now he was proud about this because it meant that her works had been appreciated during her lifetime, and because it meant that they would continue to turn up for years to come from different collections that were dispersed across the planet. But he was also sad about this because there were, it meant that there was no way of knowing the extent of this dispersal. The works were effectively lost. But while I wasn't surprised by the repeated mention of foreigners, what did come as a surprise to me was the way that in her letters, Emilia writes about this um, in a very particular way. Nowhere does she mention diplomats specifically, or embassy workers, or ambassadors, or foreign politicians, or anything so particular as that. Instead, throughout the letters, or 60,000 words of them, she simply refers to her supporters as foreign. In one letter she writes, I've discovered that it's the foreigners who like looking at these artworks and want to buy them too. I would prefer to take my work abroad myself so that the artwork serves as my currency and no one has to pay for me and I won't have to be a burden to anyone. I now have my own style. I've always had my own style, more or less. But people now actually talk about an area of style. It really is a true expression of what I feel and want to express. I'm reminded here of the Sri Rana Swam video that I discussed earlier, and that wonderfully unembarrassed tone in which the artist's father spoke about the importance of patronage for people's Timari Urdu. Here too, Emilia feels very unabashed to be relishing in the support of foreigners. In another letter she writes, I keep any canvas that I have left over from the parcels I occasionally get from my foreign admirers. And elsewhere she writes, I'm curious to know what you think of my artworks. Foreigners have a good opinion of them, but you are fairly old-fashioned, so perhaps they might be a disappointment to you. In yet another letter, describing a rather unusual painting that she made for a large cruise ship which was bound for Saudi Arabia, ferrying Indonesian pilgrims on their journey to the Hajj, Emilia notes that many of her usual admirers, foreigners, actually disapproved of this work. Sadly, I can't show you images of the painting itself as it's been lost, but this is the ship for which it was painted. Emilia was very proud to be commissioned to make this work. In a letter, she writes, This one is going around the world, I say. People then claim, that piece is not Emilia. So you see, people are very ungrateful. My foreign acquaintances are not pleased with this piece either. They find that it lacks the individuality of what they call Emiliaism. But that is no bad thing, because I have shown that I can most definitely master the technique when I want to. I find this interesting because it complicates my understandings of Amiria's attitude to her foreign supporters. It seems clear from the other letters that I've quoted that the foreign nature of her audience is actually a source of pride for Amiria. She delights in the portion that foreigners like her works. But here, her pride in having made a painting that is, as she puts it, going around the world, seems to outweigh the possible disappointment in finding that the work is actually not well liked, not even by her foreign acquaintances. We don't know the extent to which any of these foreigners really supported Amiria. We know that some of them gave her art materials, that others bought her works, but whether these forms of material contribution were substantial enough to really qualify as patronage remains unclear. Yet we do know that their support, or perhaps patronage, was not only material, but also critical. It encouraged Emilia at a time when she was receiving very little encouragement from either the Dutch correspondent or from the male Indonesian artists alongside uh, whom she was exhibiting. So it seems that the foreign nature of the backing that Emilia received was, an importance, was important to her. Bearing in mind that this last letter was about a painting she made for a ship that carried Muslim pilgrims to Mecca. I wonder if we can rethink this valorization of the foreign, not as some kind of embarrassing colonial mentality, perhaps, but rather as a strident and empowering expression of the scale of Miriam's ambition, and indeed the scale of ambition that many artists in Southeast Asia have displayed. So another question. 
has private contribution to Southeast Asia matched the global ambitions of artists in the region? This is one of a series of questions that I'd like to leave you with in lieu of a conclusion for this paper, which, as I said at the beginning, has been about trying to stay with the troubling instability of what private patronage might mean in this region, rather than offering any answers. Some other questions. Some other questions. What counts as private when the lines between the individual and the institution seem to dissolve? What counts as private when individuals embody states and or corporate institutions? What counts as patronage when small and dispersed individual acts, for example, purchases, one-off purchases by different acts, they cumulatively have large effects on art ecologies and on art histories? And what can history teach us about this interplay between the private and the public in patronage as it continues to play out today? And what does the foreign signify in all of this? As I warned, I have no answers for these questions, but I think that gatherings such as this, which have begun to focus our attention on these slippery and unstable phenomena we call private patronage, will be a good place to begin to think about them. Thank you very much. even in my film, uh, dealing with patronage, dealing with collectors, dealing with what is public and what is private. Um, and I would like to propose these ideas to you. 
have. Um, when we talk about when we talk about um, uh, ways, when we talk about private patronage, what we what do we think about? We think about collectors. We think about um, people and individuals who support projects and trans like translations, publications, buying of artworks. Um, and in this presentation, I'd like to propose that we go beyond these. Um, not that they are not important. I feel that um, I'd like to propose a sort of a larger kind of scheme. And um, I'd like, so in the, the focus of this presentation would actually be on um, private resources. Basically, um, you know, resources from individuals going into public goods, you know, um, outcomes that have public touch points with, public, with the public as beneficiaries. If you actually think about a lot of the, the purchasing, the collecting of artworks, the, the buying of, uh, the supporting of translation or publications, they're usually one-to-one -one with artists um, as an intermediary. But if you actually look more and more in the, I think since, <coughs> maybe uh, the later part of 2000 you was with the, the, the proliferation of public, uh, private museums. Um, you know, the meaning of private, um, as Roger has also rightly pointed out, it's actually taken on a, a, a lot more nuance, uh, like uh, interpretation. So I'd like to, so for the focus of this discussion, I'd like to go beyond collecting. So if you are, and I'd like to make a distinction between a patron and a collector. So in the context of my discussion, when I refer to a patron, I, I make a distinction that the patron might not be a collector. You can contribute to the art without collecting artworks. And there are many people who do that, more and more. Now, you may ask, why do we deal with Indonesia and Singapore? I mean, it is such a strange combination. Yeah, both of them are actually from Southeast Asia. Well, there are a few reasons why I picked this combination. Um, the one, I think that it gives an overview of systems and modes of operation in Southeast Asia that are in, I would say, quite, um, uh, with, with quite contrasting attributes uh, to each other. Um, and there are individuals and um, developments within each of these scenes that uh, are quite unique. Um, and secondly, in Indonesia especially, I feel that they are, um, we see more and more of private patrons as uh, agents of change. That means they don't see themselves as just collecting art, they see themselves as change, as as agencies to effect change. And I feel that that is, um, and, and these, these contributions have been sustained. Um, they are quite committed. And I would like to use this presentation to actually draw attention to some of these efforts. And these, not all of them are collectors, just a, a few of them. Um, and these, now, Indonesia and Singapore, this is actually one way of looking at Indonesia and Singapore. These, these are two charts that I sort of put together during my, um, for my master's dissertation. Um, it's actually called from 14,000 auction transactions um, uh, uh, on the Southeast Asian pictures um, in the span of 14 years. So you actually see the bulk of the pie is Indonesia, and where does Singapore sit? 0.8% uh, in 2003, and then 1.2% in 2008. What does this mean? This means that Indonesian buying of artworks contribute to 80% of all, the entire auction turnover of all Southeast Asian paintings and artworks. This is how sizable 
the Indonesian art market is. And Singapore is one of the smallest, probably next to Thailand, right, which sits at uh, 0.5, and this was in 2003. Now, I put the two pies together, you, there is actually very, very little change. Now, why do we actually talk about this? We talk about this just to give you another slice of the picture to say, well, when we talk about collectors, we talk about this scale, we talk about this difference, we talk about the number of people that are in Indonesia that are already collecting art or who are already involved in art. <coughs> okay, between the two, this is, for the entire presentation, I've been thinking, how do I, you know, there are so many, um, it can be quite a complex picture. And so, what I've done is, I've actually put it into kind of a visual representation. They are not empirical. Uh, that means I didn't draw the size of a head according to the difference, you know, uh, in the art market. This is just to show you that now, in, in terms of Singapore, you actually see this um, uh, the presence of the government uh, as quite dominant. They are, I would call it, a master engineer of the scene um, of both patronage and private patronage. I will talk about why. The public can actually get into a private space later. Uh, they, when you see Singapore, you see infrastructure, you see systems, you see policies, you see governance, you see, you see tax incentives, right? Getting into this 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 very private area of of, of art uh, collecting, and um, and even into um, you know uh, encouraging giving in, into artistic courses. But when you see Indonesia, the opposite happens. You don't really see the presence of government. You see a lot of champions. You see a lot of advocates. Um, they are greater good advocates of art and artists. Um, a lot of activities being generated privately. A lot of audience building activities that actually pin up the gaps in the system. This is not empirical. Now, if you were to ask me, why is it orange and why is that green? Okay, I cannot tell you that it's based on some, some any kind of data. It's just my way of trying to communicate a very complex system and just putting it into one page for you to understand the relationship. Now, if we were to um, talk about <coughs> in these say, sort of six pockets, so we have the support of the community of patrons and collectors, we have the galleries, we have the schools and artists, I call them, you know, producers and practitioners, uh, and of course the academics are also there. Then we have the museum infrastructure, uh, the scholarship, the writing, the archiving, then we have the contemporary collection or lack of, then we have the issue of funding. Now, in my slide, um, the orange are red. It's not orange, it's red. So basically, the red communicates what is severely lacking. And the green is, you know, what is really healthy. Now, with this as an introduction, let's... Now, you know, when, we, when, I, talk about, when I talk about the lack of museum infrastructure, it's not just a hearsay. Now, recently I asked, I connected with uh, somebody from uh, the Indonesian government who used to run Bankrupt, which is this creative agency. Uh, they were formed in 2015 um, by the Indonesian government to actually produce, uh, to give like a grant and support to um, uh, optimize the potential of artists and the creative industries. But, uh, and I think for a few years, the creative industry, including art, actually benefited from some of their funding. Um, but Baycraft was dissolved after four years after uh, when Jokowi actually put the creative economy, and when I say creative economy, you will see all these, um, the sectors in yellow. You know, these are all the sectors that actually share funding uh, from what Baycraft has uh, actually allocated. 
right? So it, the Baycroft, uh, the creative economy was actually merged with tourism. And since then, not much support has actually gone into the artists or creative community. And so this lack of infrastructure facilities is not my own words, but this was actually taken from their brochure. Okay, let's talk about individuals. When I, um, where there are about five or six people uh, who's actually been contributing to this scene on a sustained basis. And I, I, one of them is actually Ibu Melani. Now, um, of all the wonderful things that she's done for art, I feel that the, there are four particular activities that she has done over the years, since 1977, that has contributed to both the, the, the ecosystem and the writing of artistry. I would say, but, um, more accurately, the resources for writing. Let's look at them. Well, you, what you see are, well, actually two pictures of the same volume, and these are publications that will be coming out by the end of this year. They are a collection of 5,000 photographs. Um, well, I would say the Yellow Book um, is a collection of just 5,000 photographs that she has taken of exhibition openings that she has been, she's been to since 1984 of each and every Indonesian artist on show. You're talking about uh, Brazil, Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, everywhere. She keeps track, she attends, she takes a picture of the exhibition, a general view. She takes a picture of favorite works, right? So it is not documentation per work per se, and then she will take social pictures. Oh, okay, let's get together. These are people who attended the exhibitions. Now, since 1984 to the present, this photo collection uh, is 100,000 pictures. So about two or three years ago, the University of Melbourne, um, uh, one of the patrons from the University of Melbourne has actually offered to publish some of these photographs um, and offer them as archives um, and also to be accompanied by a second book of essays that are contributed from different people from the art world. So, and the first one is the Indonesian art world 1977. 1977 is actually the very first picture um, to 2021 and then the second one is the essay. Now, I uh, recently I, I contacted Ibu Malani and I said, Ibu, can you please tell me what have been the users of what you have done, of your work, of this, you know, 40 over years of uh, archives? And she said, well, I actually get calls from writers uh, who are researching for an article, for, for essays, on, oh, can I have the picture? Do you have this picture of this, uh, this artist exhibiting during this time at this place? So this is beginning to happen, but not on an extensive basis because this publication is not even out yet, right? This is not heavily publicized. Now, the second thing that Ibu Malani has actually done is she's actually been um, on, on this, I would say, a public errand um, to bring attention to um, art centers and art communities that are outside of Jakarta. And she's actually, uh, so her part in this is she actually brings advice, she goes and visits these artists and communities and she says, okay, what do you need? And they obviously want to grow, they obviously want to know how to branch out from wherever they are, they obviously want to be introduced to the centre, a Jakarta, you know, Job Jakarta. So she goes to them. <laughs> She goes to them, she brings people who are interested to get to know them. And so over the years, since 2017, she's been bringing people um, to uh, Padang Bukit Tinggi, Padang Panjang, West Sumatra, uh, Makassar in Sulawesi, and just um, uh, introducing the rest of the world to them and for them to, you know, to be connected. And this includes not just contemporary artists, if they are contemporary artists in the scenes, but also indigenous art. 
So she's actually given me a million pictures, but I'm just showing a few, just to give you an idea here. Okay. Now, the third thing that Ibu Malani has done is she's since, uh, I think since 2015, she's gone on Instagram. This lady is in her 70s. And for every exhibition that she attends, she posts. She didn't just post, she tags. So why is it useful? If you want to know more about certain artists, you see CG Art Space, you see the solar exhibition, you will see the artist's name. You can go on Instagram, you can go on account, you can type hat and you will see all her, her posts on that particular artist's exhibitions in the past. You see Anitam. And I think she's, uh, she's, she's got a very well-followed Instagram account. So, so let's try, try to frame what she, uh, her activities into um, descriptions. So in her photo archive, what has she actually done? She's actually archived exhibition history, right? Well, they may not be in the shape or form that an art historian or writer may need. Like for example, I want one actual work of uh, each uh, a, a photo documentation of each work in this particular exhibition. She may not do it like that. In her subjective, she actually exercises subjective judgment. She says, oh, oh, I like this work. I will photograph this work, right? So I did have a conversation with her. I said, well, in, you know, what about the rest of the works in the exhibition? And she says, oh, wow, there's Indo art now. You know, there's another source. So she's also cognizant of the fact that there are other archivists, not professional archivists, but who've actually been committed to this role of archiving and how what her uh, and how her work actually connects to this. Okay, she audience develops when she actually brings people. And uh, if for example, if you are interested to check out artists at in Sunawasi, you can literally write to her and she will she will rope you in for the next work. Is that open? Of course. Um, she also, oh, she also, she's also into patient development and that's the last thing she, she does. She is, since 2017, she's volunteered <coughs> to be the president of this, um, I would say, One Peace Club. It's kind of an association of mm, young yeah, collectors. So in this association, um, the the members who join this so-called club are encouraged to collect one artwork a year. Just one. So throughout the year, if you're a club member, you will be invited to different art um, exhibitions and you know and their activities and talks. But also she involves the, the presence of um, also very uh, experienced collectors so that they can be in conversation. And the third is at the end of each year, they will all be exhibiting their acquisitions. Right? So, look, she is also nurturing the next generation of art collectors. Oh, the last thing that she does, um, since 1977, for every Indonesian artist who are exhibiting in Jakarta, who does not, who did not have a place to stay, they stay with her in her residence. So she's housed different artists over the years. And some of the artists, this was the building, it's been torn down now. This, she's actually um, moved out of this place. So this was actually her backyard. So in this building is like an artist quarter and there's an exhibition space. So she would invite artists to also do shows. And she knows, she would know people in the art world and she would invite the various people in that world and say, look, you know, this is this artist from this, come and look at this work. So, exactly what does her contribute, what does her work contribute to? She deepens the appreciation of art and art collecting, right? And uh, she contributes to the lack of museum infrastructure. She, her archiving work 
of some, you know, to a certain degree, contribute to resources on art scholarship. Uh, for the lack of content, uh, for the collection, her, she also encouraged a new generation of uh, collectors. And by telling everyone about it, she encouraged circulation of the different uh, sectors that otherwise work in solo. Of course, you know Nende Teo and Malayasma, but I feel for, for completeness, when we talk about patrons, um, you know, our, our, first, our first idea is that like, patrons usually, they are money, you know, they are, are well-endowed uh, folks. Um, but you know, in Indonesia, they may not be so. And some of these people, like for example, Nende Teo and Malayasma, they are artists. And in our, in our discussions today, Artists have been beneficiaries. But in some of these examples, artists are the patrons. And with uh, Nindityu and um, Bella, they actually met in art school. Um, and, um, and I asked him, how did you come up with the idea of starting an art space? He said, at that time, um, there were a lot of artists wanting to exhibit and, but it, the, the whole scene was actually um, managed by gatekeepers who were senior lecturers of the institute and it's, it was so difficult to break through. And also, of course, that really also was a time where there was um, scarcity in the exhibition uh, space and um, artists really wanted to be part of this kind of um, artists have a voice and they have something to say. So they decided to first, uh, you know, to um, use their home, they carved out their living room for exhibition. Um, this is not their living room now, but um, this is the current charity. Uh, so they turned it into a, a, an exhibition area and then they allow artists to develop and show performance and installation works during that time. Um, and works that were otherwise be very, very difficult to show uh, because at that time it was very, very sensitive due to the, the oppressive Suharto uh, regime. And so the works were mostly coded, um, but it actually gives artists the chance to actually vent their political resistance. And since then, uh, Chimati uh, has actually moved, and this is the current space. Now, Chimati Arts House, this is the gallery, the right is the gallery space and the left is actually an artist residency next to it. What is also interesting is that it didn't sit as an art space. At some point, um, the Chimati uh, um, Art House, uh, they, there was some other, like um, I would say, uh, it became a foundation because, uh, and there was, a, so it became a sister foundation because there was a lot of needs and artists actually had limited um, access to equipment and computers and they were not very good in trying to communicate um, their own works and, and developing portfolios and so Trinity actually stepped in but they created this other vehicle called Trinity Art Foundation to do that kind of work to support artists and so then they were as artists were done like uh, showing works they were also contributing to the Trinity archives at that time. So you can see it was an archive mostly of the political resistance, a documentation of political resistance of that time. But it didn't stop then. Uh, the period after, you know, artists decided to contribute their, you know, continue to contribute their art, the archives of the work to Trinity. So this was a living organization, uh, a living organism, I would say, and later they named it as Indonesian um, Visual Art Archive. And this is like a, a space, uh, the, the screen. I was there for screening, and you know, uh, in two zero one five, and you know, this was a gathering, and this was the and people gather here to do film screenings, discuss, and, and talk about artworks. So. Um, Farah Wadami actually says, what struck me as special about the Trinity Art Foundation archives was not only that it provided good resources to develop historic graffiti, but from the archives we can see the strong relation between the development of the artwork and the society. 
Then this is the most recent development. Uh, Lindiku actually uh, talk, um, told me about this uh, small house that they have acquired called Uma Manga. So um, when the house is not in use by an artist in residence, they would actually rent out on Airbnb. So the funds from the Airbnb goes back, get held back into programming and um, residencies. Okay, so, so from uh, Lindetil and Mela's um, contribution, they actually contributed towards this infrastructure and archives and scholarship. And of, and of course, the circulation. Then, of course, there's uh, Leong Jin, we saw um, earlier on uh, with Roger's slide, um, Dr. Hui. Now, he's one of few. Um, I would say people in Indonesia with private museums, and we're going to talk about two of them today, very quickly. Um, he actually, uh, I would, of all the collectors, and especially with my definition of a collector may not be a patron, and of the collectors who are patron, why would I single him out to talk and refer to him as a patron? Because he is one collector who. Um, has been com committed into collecting the, the history of the development of Indonesian society. Now, if you if one goes into his private museum, you can actually see works by different artists um, from different era. He tries to represent as broadly as possible. Now, this is not without problems, because again, yes, um, it is one man show. It is his subjective judgment. He decides what to acquire. Um, so basically, he's using his connoisseurship and he's selecting the artworks, he's putting exhibitions, and he publishes catalogs. And because of this particular activity that uh, he, um, he actually published, he actually had a major exhibition when he was 72 years old. And so there was a huge exhibition and he published catalogs. Uh, of his collection at that period of time and that erupted into a major scandal all over Indonesia because then people were saying, oh, that's fake and this is fake and that's fake. Now, um, and that was the subject of my film and actually opened up uh, uh, many uh, related discussions about what is private and what is public and this grey area in between. And so basically, um, yeah, I would still consider I would still consider him as a patron, uh, because of his commitment over the years to represent. So, if you're a scholar of art and you want to know the story of art, he is one. His collection is one area you can look at, right? Knowing the problems of a one-man museum, a private museum, but he is one good way. Uh, his museum is one source of getting information. Okay. Now, Indo Art Now, I don't know if you know of this um, organization. I would say it's like a collective, but it's actually, uh, it started in 2011. It's mainly used by Indonesians. It's mainly known by Indonesians, right? And what do they do? They started, uh, they started by Tong Tan Dio. Of course, you saw him, he's not here uh, now, but he was here in the morning. Uh, he's an Indonesian. He is now the founder, and the, he's now the director of uh, Art Jakarta. So, in 2011, um, there was, uh, he actually felt that there was uh, a lack of exposure of Indonesian artists. At that time, Indonesian artists were getting quite a lot of attention. Now, remember this is 2011, you know, in 2007, there was this, the, the auction market actually was following Indonesian contemporary art very, very closely. And then by end of 2008, we went into this, uh, of course, um, you know, then Mas Riyadi's work hit $1 million, right? And after that, the whole thing just collapsed. Thereafter, the market was picking up, the scene was picking up. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of curiosity as to what Indonesian artists were producing, where were they showing, what were they making. So Tom actually took on this challenge and said, you know what, 
let's make this available, let's use the internet wisely. So he set up this website. It began as a simple website of um, exhibitions of Indonesian artists all over the world. So it's called indoart.com, right? Um, so he, what he did was he worked with every single gallery who were exhibiting Indonesian artists' work and said, look, give me all the pictures of the exhibition, everyone, and every painting that is on show, right? And so he would, at that time, I think he started with three people. So his support came not so much in the form of money. Yeah, of course, he supported the salary, but more in creating this structure, not overnight, like, I mean, not in a short time, but since 2011, you know, and he supported this team. And it's this same team that continue to grow and still, you know, runs Indo Art now. So then, what they do was they work with galleries, and over the years they build this archive. Um, so this archive actually sits very, very well with Ibu Malani's archive. So when we, we talked about Ibu Malani, this was the archive that she was talking about, and this was freely available, right? If you, and then later they went into artist video because there was so much demand. They said, oh, but what is this artist like? How, what's this artwork about? So, oh, let's commission videos. I think they've done 100, 100 over videos, each of them three, four minutes. So he commissioned those videos and he put it online. And then recently he started Jakarta Art Hub. So basically, um, let me talk about it later with, with the pictures. Okay. Indoartnow.com. Uh, now I asked him, can I have some traffic figures? Would you be able to show? So he helped to actually got, you know, get this data for me uh, this time. So these are historical figures. Um, I would like to say that the Indo Art Now uh, is kind of a documentation of, of, uh, um, of art videos actually stopped during COVID. Uh, because number one, there was a lack of funding, you know, it was quite difficult for everyone. And number two, um, there was, yeah, so I think he, he, um, he, he stopped for the few years um, uh, during COVID. And since then, they've been trying to ask galleries to upload, you know, I'll give you the password, why don't you upload the pictures yourself? But it has not worked. So far, everybody has been quite late in doing themselves. So he thinks that they will have to take over and just upload and do it retrospectively, right? Uh, but look at look at the traffic. Look at the traffic. Um, okay, the first one is Radan Saleh. Well, we have six hundred and nineteen thousand views. And I asked him, can you please tell me the geographical composition of the six hundred and nineteen thousand views? And of all the 52,000 views, 16,000 views, where are these people come from? So he, he checked and um, he says, you know what, 90% Indonesian. What does that tell you? Well, the 10% were mainly European countries, Singapore, you know, a little bit of America. But what does that tell you? It tells you, well, Indonesians use their own archives, number one. Number two, the 10% shows, tells you that the rest of the world does not know this exists yet. So this is trying, this is getting, uh, this, they, are, they, are, they are backdating this, right? Um, yeah, this is the, uh, those are the, um, I mean, this is, this is the same stats, okay. Okay, this is, remember I talked to you about Jakarta Art, um, uh, Jakarta Art Hub. Now, uh, during the pandemic, uh, one of his um, one of the curators by the name of Enin Suprianto, of course you will know him, uh, Enin looked at the scene and said, you know, there is actually a niche uh, for showing artworks that are both mm, challenging in content, but would also have some commercial success. And so he started this organization, this art space called Mubana, which means underground basement. And he showed um, artists um, in that space, right? Uh, it, 
was sound art, performance art, you know. The collectors at that time were just buying certificates without like objects. So Indonesian collectors were quite open. Now eventually, uh, during the during COVID, it was actually quite difficult because everybody was tied in. And oh, in this space, he allowed the purchase of artwork. It was not just exhibition, and that's how they he imagined the funding to be and the sustenance to be. Then they met with some he met with some difficulty, and Tom Kandu came in and and supported the rental of the space. After the pandemic, uh, so since Rubana has actually um, set up, uh, so Tom actually persuaded the rest of the galleries that he you know he's an art director. I mean, sorry, he's an art fair director. Right? He knows a lot of galleries. He knows a lot of people. So he <laughs> persuaded them, hey, why don't you come to this building? Let's create a, a hub for everybody to see the works of emerging artists. You know, and, uh, what artists are producing in Indonesia. Otherwise, it's very fragmented. So, and one by one, artists, uh, galleries actually joined. And this is actually a, a how do you say, a recent article. And it read, this, this came from them. Post-pandemic, fine art has actually grown into an attract, attractive vacation tool for the public. The art ecosystem has become a remedy again. The old building, which was originally an office space, has changed its appearance. Inside, it no longer contains cubicles with computers and piles of files, but works of fine art that refresh the eye. Since opening last year, the Jakarta Art Hub has never been empty, especially on weekends, and visitors can reach 600 people a day. Okay, so these are areas that I feel Indo Art now actually contributed. Right? Of course, circulation. Right, in my discussion, in my thinking, oh, what, who else should I actually signal? Well, this is a private museum. Now, you realize that my first uh, response is not to talk about private museum owners because uh, private museum owners may not be patrons, in my view. Right? They may be collectors, but if we, we talk about public good, and they may or may not be patrons. So for Machan, I think that Machan is an important, has become an important player and contributor to the scene. Um, not in term, not just in terms of the quality of shows of Indonesian artists, but also uh, shows uh, from outside um, and it is, has been staged to a very, very high level. Um, but also for the publications Recently, I was there and I got uh, Melati's uh, publication. It was well researched. You know, um, it actually plugs the gap and contributes to the, to the to the lack of critical um, scholarship. Okay, so these are areas that they plug into. Um, and of course, last but not least, this person by the name of Ryu Wakono. Now, his contribution is um, less visible in that sense. Now, um, about 2008, I met him in 2008, and at that time, um, he made an impression because he was very eager to get your number. And he says, you know, I will tell you about Indonesian art every week. And so I gave him my number. At that time, it was more, uh, he was working on his Blackberry, right? He would key in, and then every Monday morning, you receive a Text. You receive a text on all the exhibitions that are happening for Indonesian artists. And he will tell you, and there will be questions that he raised, there will be discussion points, and he actually funded um, these SMSs, right? And sometimes, uh, he, you know, each of these uh, messages would, would take five SMSs per person. So imagine the number of SMSs he actually sent. And he did that for, I think, maybe five years until there was other people who, there was more effective medium of communicating all these um, events. But he also did something else. Um, he started, if you actually see him, wherever you see him, he will always be with the crowd. And there will always be um, people who are interested in art and interested in collecting art. 
right? Maybe if you're not sure, you can be part of his entourage. And so basically at that time, uh, he was organizing an um, art lover's dinner. Well, it's a very generic dinner, and, you know, sound, uh, sounded a bit cliche, but he would actually gather these people and, okay, let's talk about art weekly, right? And they would invite artists to present over their dinner. And I can only talk about it now because I'm seeing his work after, I don't know, 12 years, 13, 14 years. Now, the first generation of these people who joined his Art Lovers Dinner have become art patrons and art collectors in their own rights. They are all doing independent projects. They are all forging their head in a way and having a place and playing a, an important role in the Indonesian art world. And he's not stopping, he's continuing this effort. Now, the second thing that I'm, um, is also this. Recently, his um, he told me he collected this book. And this is actually a work um, that is under the sea. I said, how do you collect a work that is not in your premise? He said, well, you know, uh, in the book, um, in it. So he actually contacted uh, Tegu. Tegu at that time has been doing under the sea installation for this a particular place in Samburan in Bali uh, is brought is it, <coughs> okay. of, of injury. So so anyway, so um, he he together with two other collectors started um, uh, Evelyn Halim and Abigail Hakim. They uh, uh, they actually commissioned the work um, by Tego to be installed in this place. Um, and, and they work with this German marine biologist who actually runs a, like a villa kind of a resort nearby who studied the water conditions and he promised to up, upkeep the work. So basically, you see, uh, so that's under the sea kind of a thing. So in terms of acknowledgement, in terms of the physical work, they don't have any physical work in the office or, or, or you know, residence. So all they have is a video, the same uh, pictures, just to say, okay, this is part of my collection. This is one of the projects I support. Okay. Now, let's quickly talk about Singapore. I'll just... Um, now, you, you know about the museum infrastructure. Well, in the last year, Singapore government has actually uh, put in about 184 million into the physical infrastructure and then 150 million, 155 million through giving of grants and disbursement of grants and artists of There's a lot of money. Um, but you know, this role of uh, giving grants is actually also um, problematic in that they are both the connoisseur and the patron at the same time. So, in terms of the government, what do they do? So, what they do is, other than giving grants and giving the, 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 providing the infrastructure, they also structure, they engineer private and, and encourage private giving by structuring incentives for you, for others to be giving to this. Like, for example, if you were to be giving money to any of the you know, four or five organizations, you get 250% tax rebate. But they have to be registered charity. And these four organizations are. Number two, they will match dollar for dollar. Right? Uh, so if you give 50,000 or 10,000, they will match it. And secondly, they provide uh, recognition to those people who give. So every year they will be celebrating and then of course your name will be there and this happened in 1984, 83, 84. Yeah. Okay. In the beginning, 1983, in the beginning, the givers were mostly, if you can see, organizations. There were no private patrons. There were no individuals as such. And, um, and these people gave to festivals and you know, cultural projects. But in 2022, there were 404 patrons um, with 130, 313 individuals. 
And if you want to know the kind of activity they're getting to, for example, the, the contributed works to the museum, uh, they have Gojek Bright vouchers for the visitors to the Biennale, so they try to recognize each and every kind of giving in order to encourage you to continue what you do, to give to the arts. Okay, so if you can see between Indonesia and Singapore, um, the Indonesian kind of patronage is more decentralized. Uh, it comes from diverse sources, they are more varied in nature, and there are initiatives that, that actually plug a, systematic gap, uh, a systemic gap. Um, yeah, and the meaning and the usefulness come from sustained contribution. Right. And all the individuals that I've talked about, they've actually done it for years. Okay, now, this is the last few slides. Um, now, there are some, these are some things that I've seen in recent years uh, in, the private, uh, in the Singapore scene. Um, they, they seem to be more private funding going into supporting our museums. Uh, I was just talking to one of the museum uh, uh, officials and she actually related that it, since the pandemic, yeah, we have a lot more in immigrants into Singapore, the giving into, uh, to museums has actually shot up. Right? And these are Chinese national, Indian nationals, just giving to our, our museums. And recently, uh, there is this uh, art fund uh, that's connected to the government-run uh, Sea Focus. Um, so uh, a, a, a panel would, was convened and whatever the selections would actually go into the collection of uh, the NGS, oh, uh, Singapore Museum, sorry, Singapore Museum. So, yeah, so you can see, and you know this kind of contributing um, to museums is not only in Singapore. I see more and more kind of acquisitions by individuals into either a collective or a group who actually selects the work and then the work selected will then go into museum collection. So you will see more and more now. I, I can't talk about them because they are not official yet, So, but uh, look out for them. So what does it say? Our museums will be better and better resourced. Right? Um, lastly, in the last few years in COVID, uh, during COVID, I see more and more artists spaces coming up remember uh, and these are benefit ben beneficiaries in our in our discussion today but this is in singapore where your space is really scarce and expensive and just now we actually talk about how um how the government trying to address that by having you know rental that is uh, going at 10 percent well um so this is one uh, this is one, and they have this 190 <coughs> square feet of space. So Robin is actually an educated artist, Sai is an, an artist, and so he, they actually make use of this space to actually bring in artists, one artist, one emerging artist every month. Right? Uh, this is Kimberly and Sabrina now. Kimberly was the was um, was the winner of one of the Impact Art Awards um, Artist Prize, I think during COVID, yeah. And she received 20,000. So recently, I was just doing a, like a studio visit uh, and I came across this space that she actually rented with Sabrina. Both of them are teaching, right? And it was it's, it's in an old shopping center and next to, I would say, a pub. You can hear the music dumping in the background and so, you know, but what they've done is actually making this available to artists, emerging artists who actually have ideas who want to actualize their projects. So where do they pay it from? They pay from the, the monthly rent actually came from the paycheck, from teaching. Um, but the initial uh, rental came from her winning, her $20,000 winning, you know, from being like the winner artist from the Art Award. So she put it in this space. And of course, there's uh, Moses in Starch. Uh, his father actually owns uh, a furniture business, uh, and then this is a warehouse. So he makes it, he made it available. He's been making it available to emerging artists as well to show. And of course, we know uh, Robert Chow and Ahmed uh, Sunyan. So they too make their their space available to emerging artists. 
And of course, the, the most famous is our artist Archives, uh, Hong Wan Pao. Uh, so he basically amassed all kinds of literature, collaterals, um, since the 80s. Uh, he, he stores them in his flat, his government housing flat. Um, and the reason why he stores, and somebody asked him, oh, we have national archives, why do you continue to archive this? He says, no, the National Archives were really just a record of the government. It tended to be a record of what politicians said at an event, not the event itself. So he takes an artist's view and he documents it. So what can we learn from here? I, I would say that this is an emerging, developing, changing space as we go. Yeah, okay. Um, so the meaningful ones are those that actually that, uh, has been done on a sustained basis and uh, this, this private and public kind of um, conundrum actually is an interesting phenomenon that just happened and I feel that you know, it's something that we should continue to talk about in future uh, discussions on private patronage. And with that, um, I end my presentation. Thank you. ขอเริ่มช่วงสุดท้ายคือช่วงถามตอบเลยนะคะเดี๋ยวพี่ก็จะทําเอ่อ <laughs> เป็นภาษาอังกฤษหรือว่าภาษาไทยก็ได้เหมือนตอนช่วงเช้านะคะถ้าเอ่อต้องการให้เป็นช่วยแปลเป็นภาษาอังกฤษให้ก็ถามห
there is another kind of uh, patronage you could have mentioned, uh, which is corporate patronage. And in this case, I'm uh, thinking about the network of Bandra Mudaya, which is uh, funded by a Compass, Good Compass, which is a, a media group. And they play an important role in uh, commissioning uh, works, uh, art and crafts. And they did so at the beginning in the 50s and the 60s. And it was initiated by the founder of Compass, the lady, the uh, newspaper, Victoria. And uh, it's still on the The question is, as far as I understand, as I've seen, most of the uh, uh, the or the collectioners you've shown are uh, Chinese Indonesian. Is it just by chance, or do you think there is a special interest for the, the small Chinese community in Indonesia, for Chinese uh, Indonesian, uh, a better interest or better understanding or uh, higher sensitivity to uh, patronage? to the necessity for private parts to help the commission and to uh, promote artists. Sorry, uh, Jerome, um, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. Is your question, uh, uh, why were the examples of the patrons I, I listed mostly Chinese Indonesian? Okay. Yeah, uh, I think my approach today was not so much a comprehensive encyclopedic one. Um, because when I defined this as a 20 minutes uh, kind of a presentation, um, and with an encyclopedic kind of approach, I would definitely miss a lot of individuals and organizations. So that's why you, you don't see any of institutions, you know, as in corporates, uh, or whether it's Compass or anybody else. But um, I was more interested in, in presenting this view that you don't need to have money to be a patron because we are so attached. Uh, we always uh, put money and patronage together. And so my focus today was more individuals. Um, so yes, but the second reason is because also I feel that there is um, this area of company getting in, involved um, in in patronage is also understudied. Um, so far, my encounters with the Indonesian art scene has been through my film, and of course that sort of opened that world up. Um, and there is some contact with you know different members of the, the, the art scene, but uh, so I feel that the availability of information uh, to a researcher, even to actually present something like this, looking for information from, say, Bikraf or, you know, um, uh, different players, it wasn't easy because these are not published information. You know, I had to call different people to say, oh, I need this information, who do I go to? And then it's, oh, you should call this guy and then this guy to actually get one page. So, um, I feel that this is one area that, um, that should actually, but some, you know, we should actually continue discussion and, and research on. Uh, and I've just barely touched the surface. Uh, secondly, I, I, um, for me, for the interest of my, I can't really explain why uh, a lot of all these collectors are rich, uh, are, are Chinese. I think, yeah, I think it, you know, um, a lot of them are actually very visible. Uh, the, the ones that are visible in the collectors that don't tend to be Chinese. Um, but uh, I have, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, I would like to raise my question to uh, Professor uh, Ronnie Kassi. Um, by the time that uh, the, the art space was active, um, today, Today, um, the, the space actually have any connection, or by the time do we know that uh, in Bangkok there was any kind of independent aspect uh, uh, um, beyond this one that you presented? Do we have any independent aspects in time by the end of uh, the period of this? Sorry, or maybe I'm a little bit uh, excited. Um, 
The question is that during the time in the circle of this um, institution, if we can say, do they have any, how to say, during that time, other than this institution, do we have any other art space that not actually the state run um, organization, or it's just the only one um, we have in, in Bangkok that we can? In Bangkok? Actually, uh, when the PRC closed down, but uh, in I think in the 80 decade, decade to 90 decade, it's a more a more commercial and artist run gallery. And about the institute, I think. Uh, According to Kunchak Bichai, the old director of uh, PRC, told me uh, also BACC is the one of uh, inspiration from uh, PRC Institute because uh, after uh, PRC closed down uh, back home. Uh, it's not institute uh, like uh, like uh, like a BRC. Uh, a government uh, <coughs> museum or or gallery museum, uh, gallery official from government museum is not the uh, activity like like a uh, free like a uh, BRC institute. But uh, this reason is an inspiration for uh, for the team and for the and management to move up and add this to add this and um, art lover politician uh, and art lover to uh, to support and movement uh, BCC is a is a one of of the studio that that uh, is by 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 years many times I just want to know um, how the circle at the time really function. Is that only PRC Center? Like a scam, the only one that stand alone and run this kind of activities? Or you have some smaller space that probably um, just knows only in oral history? I mean, just not officially. But interesting in, in, in this issue because uh, the team at BRC Institute uh, is not good job which I only, but uh, the staff, I think, uh, like, uh, okay, uh, one could now talk, Santa, or Kun Jung Hon Isu, or this is a person who grow with uh, from BRC. And grow and, and they build a, a gallery or activity after them and have the movement before uh, uh, after them a uh, day before a uh, day movement to to uh, to support for for the institute, art institute in in Bangkok. This. Uh, perhaps I uh, will help a bit on this. คุณอาจารย์กระดกวันอยากจะทราบว่าในช่วงที่หอศิลป์พีระศรียังแอคทีฟอยู่อะค่ะมันมีอาร์ตสเปซอื่นๆที่ไม่ใช่ของรัฐ
Uh, okay, I switch to English. Um, well, I just help emphasizing the questions about uh, the art scene around the time that the BRC Institute of Modern Art was active. The question is whether is there any other art spaces or galleries um, running at the same time but might be lesser known or exist only oral, in oral histories? And the answer is yes, there were. There were private galleries and commercial galleries uh, active, uh, being active at the same time as the BUC Institute of Modern Art. <coughs> คืออย่างนี้ช่วงปี80นะพอเริ่มมามาถึงก่อนปี90ที่มันมีปัญหาแล้วจะริ่งปิดเออฮอสิเพลสีปิดปีน่าจะปิด2 28ถึง30จริงช่วงนั้นก็เริ่มมีเริ่มมีอะไรก่อนหน้านั้นนะก่อนเพลสีที่ทำไปก็มีมิทิโกซินมีเกอร์เต้เนียรีองฟองเซมีเตเป็นฟอร์เรชันนี่เป็นสเปซอันหนึ่งที่ขึ้นชอบอดทั้งหลายสิบาทก็ในส่วนรัฐบาลเองมาเปิดเอาปี2025ขอสินเจ้ามาซึ่งหลังขอสินเจ้าสีเสร็จแล้วพอขอสินเจ้าสีปิดไปเนี่ยก็เริ่มมีแกลลี่เอ่อต้องเรียกว่าเป็นเอกชนเกิดขึ้นตามขึ้นมาเพราะว่าที่ผ่านมาเรามีแค่สถาบันหนึ่งหนึ่งที่บอกโทษวิธีเราสิ้นเกิดเต้ที่ซัพพอร์ตในช่วงนั้นนั้นอย่างกรณีของเบย์พวกผมออกจากเจ้าสีมาเนี่ยผมก็หายเอ็ดีก็ทำไม่ได้คิดว่าจะทำเป็นเป็นอาชีพหรอกเรียนออกมาแล้วก็รู้จักศิลปินเยอะก็เลยจัดงานให้กับศิลปินตามพื้นที่ต่างๆซึ่งเราไม่มีพื้นที่ตอนของเริ่มต้นผมก็เริ่มจัดที่พื้นที่ที่เป็นโรงแรมด้วยซ้ำไปมีสองสามโรงแรมที่ผมไปจัดงานที่นั่นเลยอย่างเอ่ออะไรอ่ะเป็นเซรา่าซึ่งปัจจุบันนี้เปลี่ยนมาสี่สี่โรงแรมมาเป็นสี่โรงแรมมาเลยอันนั้นก็เป็นจุดเริ่มที่ทําในพื้นที่ข้างนอกผมก็อาศัยพื้นที่ที่มีอยู่จริงก็เดิมก็ไปอาศัยพื้นที่ของวิทยาศาสตร์ของเกอร์เต้ของย้อมจัดงานแล้วก็ตอนช่วงหลังมันก็เป็นเท่าพื้นที่เปิดพื้นที่แต่ว่าก่อนหน้านั้นก็มีเอาเฟดวิชุนธรรมก็เป็นชาวต่างประเทศซึ่งซึ่งสนใจแล้วทั้งหมดการเปิดพื้นที่มาหรือแม้กระทั่งช่วงนั้นก็มีแม้กระทั่งเอ่อนะโจรก็เปิดที่สุขุมวิทก็เริ่มมีแกลลี่เล็กๆเริ่มต้นขึ้นมาหลังจากที่ก่อนหน้านั้นเราไม่มีเลยแล้วก็เริ่มเริ่มเริ่มขยายขึ้นมาเรื่อยต่อมาซึ่งซึ่งอันเนี้ยในในช่วงช่วงนั้นต้องบอกจริงว่าทําให้ทําให้แม้กระทั่งรัฐบาลหรือกลุ่มคนเองให้ความสำคัญกับพื้นที่งานศิลปะจริงๆได้เกิดมีซีซีขึ้นมาด้วยส่วนหนึ่งแม้กระทั่งการมาอะไรต่างๆเนี้ยแต่สิ่งประกอบนี้มีพื้นที่อยู่แล้วที่ที่คอยที่จะสนับสนุนในในสถาบันตัวเองหรือมองเทพตอนนั้นจะต้องมามองเทพก็เปิดพื้นที่ตัวเองแล้วก็ตามไปด้วยมหาลัยต่างๆไปด้วยภาษาอังกฤษเองซึ่งอันนี้สำคัญก็เพียงแต่จะบอกว่าจริงๆแล้วก็หลังจากเสื้อสีหยุดไปเนี่ยมันก็ทําให้หลายคนเริ่มตระหนักเริ่มมองเริ่มทำครับขอบคุณค่ะคุณทองแช่ his experience as a witness of all these changes in the Thai art scene because he worked at the BMC Institute of Modern Art before when he was uh, young. And um, from his perspective, um, the impact of Mima, the BMC Institute of Modern Art, is, uh, to, um, is the influence that it gives on uh, to the private or small art spaces that open after the closure of the British Institute of Modern Art. And um, to add about the, uh, the other art spaces at that time, he said that um, besides the private and commercial galleries, the foreign organizations like the British Council, Alion Francais, and the, the Goethe Institute also provided art spaces. For, for, for artists in Bangkok. And one more thing is that um, after PRC, uh, PRC Institute of Modern Arts was closed, he decided to work, uh, to continue working with Thai artists 
But at that time, because there were so, not so many art spaces in Bangkok, he tried to organize exhibitions in places like hotel, for example, for temporary exhibition, for example, at the peninsula and some other hotels. Um, and the BACC here, the Bangkok Art and Culture Center, also took inspiration from what the BOC Institute of Modern Art did in the 80s and 90s. Um, and also the art galleries in, uh, in, art, in some art universities in Bangkok and beyond. Um, okay, the microphone, please. Um, so this is for Arjun. So um, I'm very interested in the way that you talk about the idea of the, the idea of cabinet in relation to art history. Um, I think especially the way that you talk about the patron not as someone providing infrastructural support, but as a figure in this narrative of the artist. Um, in the two artists that you mentioned, the um, Sivara Spong and Amelia Sinasa, it's, it's not about the patron supporting the artist, but the way that the artist express something, <coughs> tell stories about the patron. Um, it's almost like this patron is a kind of figure in their kind of creation of artistic subjectivity or that kind of thing uh, to me. Um, so I don't know is, is that in your broader project about the artistic art history, is that the way that you do, the way that you focus on the idea of patronage in, in the uh, in the cultivation of an artistic art history? Thank you very much for the question. Um, to be very honest, uh, I think patronage is something that I've not thought enough about, and therefore I, I don't know that it will be a, a major theme in, in my larger project about artistic art history, which is thinking about the ways in which artworks create art historical knowledge and participate in art historical discourse. But I very much appreciate your question for the way it points us to art history as a as a narrative, as, as a a story that we tell. Uh, I recently had a student in my classroom who um, was actually a medical student um, and he was asking me about why we bother to study the things that we study and I found myself saying that since we can't save lives we might as well tell nice stories. Um, and I think that one of the things that's very important about this symposium and about the question of patronage in general um, in, in our field is the way that it perhaps points us to new stories or new ways of telling old stories. So for example, in, in Pamela Corey's paper, I very much appreciated the kind of entanglement um, of different kinds of patronage, um, including the role of artists as patrons, which is something that Patricia also highlighted. So Pamela spoke about um, the two directors of the two newly formed, privately funded um, uh, foundations, um, Bill Nguyen and Le Tuan Nguyen, who both uh, credit their training uh, in large part to their formative years with the Nelson Studio, which is an artist run, perhaps if you like, artist patron. Um, so from artists as patrons to now uh, corporate education business people as patrons, these two rather disparate fields, different scales, different amounts of money, different educational backgrounds, um, become entangled in the one story through these through these individuals. So I think if we continue with this line of inquiry that Tanawi and Yin and Jerome have very generously initiated for us here, we'll see other kinds of entanglements like this. For myself, and this is, if you like, an aesthetic preference, I hope that artists and artworks can continue to be um, characters or, or scenes within those stories that unfold. Any more questions? Ah, Jang Lipa, Yong Pun, Lipa, Ha. Not right, right? Sorry, I thought my colleague raised his hand. Ah, Pamin, Pamin. Thank you. I'm 
because I just grabbed a small glimpse of, of what happens here. But uh, there are two things which have been a little striking for me. The first one, maybe you, you'll find it bizarre, but the first one is the importance of the colonial issue here, because we don't have this in, uh, in Europe. <laughs> so. Uh, it seems to be something something very relevant in, in uh, the art production and in the images and so on. So this is the first thing, the first difference which appeared very evident for me. And uh, a second observation, maybe <coughs> on uh, on uh, Patricia's uh, talk, um, is this uh, balance between private and state patronage. Uh, and I have a feeling, maybe I'm wrong, that uh, the position of Singapore resembles a little the position of France regarding uh, state commissioning and state support for contemporary art, uh, because it's very heavy, it had a lot of consequences, and it sometimes is interpreted as a kind of competition with the private, uh, private not only patronage, but private uh, market, let's say, uh, with uh, very heavy differences in the kind of art which is supported in both cases. And with, uh, um, in France, and in, especially in France, more than Europe, because the, the, the French policy has been very strong about um, public help to contemporary art. Uh, in France, there is a strong accent on uh, conceptual uh, conceptual art, let's say, um, whereas the, the uh, private collecting is more interesting in painting, in fact, and, and uh, this is why in France a lot of painters complain that because they feel that they are forgotten by the state institutions. So it would be interesting, I think, to compare, uh, for example, Germany would be the equivalent of Indonesia in the comparison with Singapore. Germany versus France, Indonesia versus uh, Singapore. Maybe. Jerome, as we were talking, I remember just in answer to your original question, your first question on why uh, most of the collectors uh, have had been more visible. Um, I remember one conversation I, I had uh, with some Indonesians and I asked the same question. And but the kind of answer that I got was just very single dimensional. It was, oh yeah, it's probably wealth. But I don't think that's true because then it cannot be that the, the indigenous, the Indonesians get, are not affluent. I just feel that um, uh, in order to answer to that, you we need to actually do a, a kind of a study, a more systematic study, where you actually apply filters with regards to um, the collection, the circulation, the the, the kind of arrays, you know, um, and do a sociological study, you know, uh, because and and also wealth, you know, to actually test that kind of assumption, and this has not been done. So I think generally that's just left there and people are just assume it's too well. But I to offer for me to offer that as an answer I think it would be irresponsible. But I think more study is needed for sure. It's a good question. Uh, 
uh, we, we should try to do uh, further research than you're right and then uh, to uh, Mandy because I'm pretty sure that outside of Java and more specifically uh, Jakarta and the region of Jakarta and the Bangalore on one side and in Bali in another side we would find very few collections very few collectioners and uh, it's much more uh, this is just to say that outside of these two places there are no artists and no collections, but they are much less visible. Yes, response to what Patricia was saying. I wonder whether this, this tendency to collect amongst the Chinese community has to do with the tradition of collecting um, within Chinese communities from China, basically. Because when the earliest communities when they arrived, they were collecting seals, calligraphy, painting, and so on. So I don't know whether this is an inclination or mentality that, um, that expanded beyond Japanese art. Yeah, I think perhaps that, that is one of the reasons. But I, from what I heard and gathered over the years is that I think the Sukarno and his passion in art and you know, collecting art and, and, and uh, his art advocacy basically actually had an infectious kind of um, uh, effect on the general population because his ministers were collecting art. The officers had art collection. The prison officers had uh, their own art pieces at home. So that sort of, you know, filtered into the general population. And uh, once I, uh, when I was doing uh, research for the film, I had the exact same question. But um, I think it, it needs to be another systematic study. But because most of the answers that I got is, oh yeah, it's just Ukano, you know, he actually set this ball rolling, but this ball rolling. But I think there, it is a multifaceted answer. Yeah, so, yeah, this question needs to be asked. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I guess we have time for the last question before we close. If there is no last question, um, I would like to thank all the speakers, um, Professor Natalie Einich, um, Mr. Lo Siri, Professor Patrick Flores, Associate Professor Siti Chang Rohita Su, Associate Professor Roger Nelson, Ms. Patricia Chen, and um, Associate Professor Pamela Corey for their wonderful presentations. I have learned a lot. I would also like to thank my co conveners Peter and Jerome Samuel. And thank you the French Embassy in Thailand, as well as the BACC and their staff. Thank you very much, all the audience, um, including those who already left. And thank you, my um, wonderful assistants, Hamin Thapanangkun, Anna Kananukun, and Chanokchon Si Sunpot for their performances today and days before today. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite my co-conveners to say a few things before we close. Things to add. I just really thank our speakers for making time to work on the fascinating papers. Really exciting. I learned a lot, and I hope that we'll be able to continue the conversation. And to everyone who made it here today, thank you so much. And thank you to my co conveners too, of course, and to the ACC and the French Embassy. my nose and my voice remain the same as this morning. Uh, really, I've learned a lot. And uh, this was very interesting. Maybe as an outsider, <laughs> except for everything related to Indonesia, I don't know. But uh, I've learned a lot. And it's really very interesting to, uh, to compare the situation, uh, an evolving situation, and former situation in several South Asian countries. And this is specifically important for us by Hassan, 
we have covering all Southeast Asia, and we always, when we organize symposium and publish books, we try to put together uh, experts, uh, researchers, uh, academics from different countries, and if possible from different uh, disciplines of land. And this enrich the, the, the discussion, of course. So thank you for your work, and thank you for uh, me and uh, Yin, the PACC, and the uh, French PACC, which is not here. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.